Hi, good morning everyone. I'm so happy to be here this morning and um, to minister the Word of God to you. Uh, we are, we've been doing a series where we were talking on uh, thinking like God and we're doing part three this morning. And um, I'm, I did it yesterday, but uh, I had a problem with my computer, so I had to, I'm doing it over again today. And, um, but it's really been something that the Lord has, has, has uh, brought into my spirit, a fresh and a new. You know, last time we were looking at the unity between God, uh, and, uh, God the Father and the Son, and how they are in a perfect unity. And um, whatever the Father says, the Son does. And uh, what the uh, Son does, the Father enforces. And, um, you know, it's so powerful when you look at this um, and you understand that unity between them. But it's more important for us to also understand that we have that same unity with the Father and the Son. And today I am going to do that. I'm going to speak on that because I want to bring us into that place where we understand that we are also in that relationship. And I know maybe these teachings are old stuff. Maybe it's stuff that you've heard before. And um, uh, I know a lot of people have heard it before. But I'm trying to bring it across in a way because where we are going with this, it's going to be so powerful. And this is to activate the church. This is to get the church to the place where we realize that each one of us are called. Each one of us have got a calling. There's something unique about us. Uh, I mean, the message that you have has been shaped in your life through the experiences you've gone through. The, uh, the life you had with your mo mother and dad. The school that you were in. Um, the people that surround you in your life, you know, I believe many of those things are God ordained. And yes, a lot of things went wrong. A lot of things were not God's plan for you. A lot of things were, was done uh, where the enemy has brought these things. But you know, God turns those things around and he uses it for the good of them that loves him. And God has got the power to, to change every wrong thing into something beautiful and make it something that gives you a message, that gives you a voice, that makes you unique. Uh, I always say, you know, a lot of people will never experience a part of God if you don't come into the fullness of what God has for you because each one of us carries something about God. God is so big, He is so vast. Uh, if you take all the people and all their different personalities in the whole world, and you put them together, then I think you can only kind of experience who God really is. The Bible says, when angels went about around His throne, they cried, Holy, 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 Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Because every time they saw something new about Him, and all they could do was cry, Holy, 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 Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Because He was so vast and so uh, uh, big, you know. And I want to encourage you this morning with that and to realize that that God wants to come and live inside of you, you know, and empower you and strengthen you and make you a spiritual man. So we were looking, our main scriptures that we were looking at, um, we started off with 1 Corinthians 2 verse 15 and 16 and we're building everything around this scripture and it talks about having the mind of Christ. And he talks about being a spiritual man. And we were working towards that to for you to understand that you are a spiritual man. So let's look at this. I'm just going to read it again. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 15. But the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into, questions, and discerns all things. Yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. This is a powerful scripture. And this is what the spiritual man does. And I spoke on that last time. You can just go back to that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, it says, For who has known or understood the mind, the counsel and purposes of the Lord, so as to guide and instruct him? And we know it's talking about the Holy Spirit, but also we have that spiritual mind to know and understand the mind and counsels of God. I don't think to instruct Him, but to understand Him. Uh, but the Bible says here, uh, He says, uh, uh, 
it says uh, uh, we, uh, we guide and instruct him and give him knowledge but we have the mind of Christ the Messiah and do hold the thoughts feelings and purposes of his heart it's so powerful it says we have the mind of Christ think about that for a minute Bible always talks about Sila stop and think we have the mind of Christ and do hold the Bible says we have it in our possession and do hold the thoughts as a believer I'm telling you when you gave your life to the Lord and he breathed his life into you he breathed a new uh, person he breathed his spirit into you and you are a spiritual man you no longer uh, a fleshly man uh, controlled by desires of the flesh you are now a spiritual man controlled by the spirit but this is something that we need to grow into this is something that we need to um, uh, appropriate and make it ours it's something that we need to understand faith comes by hearing and hearing the word so we hear it and then we need to uh, uh, grow in it and grow in it by faith and 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 so on so the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ and do hold the thoughts the feelings and the purposes of his heart and we looked at that last time so go back to video number two so uh, to this morning I'm continuing in John chapter 14 we looked at the previous verses last time um, and I want to pick up from John chapter 14 verse 19 to 24 this morning it says a little while longer and the world will see me no more but you will see me because I live you will live also uh, yeah Jesus is saying and it's Jesus talking remember it was Jesus talking to his disciples uh, before they took him to be crucified it's like his last words it's like his last thing that he he brings to them he says in a little a little while longer uh, the world will not see me no more but you will see me because I live you will live also um, powerful uh, that uh, Jesus says that we will continue to see him we will continue to be in this relationship with him knowing that him and the father was going to come to us and we're looking at that so he says at that day you will know that I am in my father what we looked at last time and you in me now he brings us into this whole thing where him and the father had this relationship he says now you know that I am in the father in that day and that is I believe when the Holy Spirit was poured out I believe when he died on the cross they realized everything that happened and especially when the Holy Spirit was poured out in that day you will know that I am in my father and you in me so he brings us into that relationship you in me and I in you that's why we will live that's why we will continue to experience him and the Bible continues it says he who has my commandments and keeps them it is he who loves me so he who has my commandments and I believe that's talking about his word you know the whole word is put together by the Spirit and uh, Paul and Peter and Luke and John and all these guys wrote uh, the New Testament which is more uh, uh, focused on us as the church but the whole of the Old Testament was talking about it as well um, so we see that we uh, if we hold these commandments the Bible says uh, he who has my commandments and keeps them it is he who loves me that word keeps them means who practice practices them who does them who, who, who makes it theirs and keeps them but you know you, you can hear the word but not keep it you can hear the word and just dismiss it but when you hear the word and you hear the commandments and here he calls the commandments because everything that is in the Bible is instruction it's not just a commandment it's instruction that God gives us he says uh, um, uh, and keeps them it is he who loves me and this is very important for you to understand the Bible says when we keep his commandments we keep his word in our hearts we start living according to it we start seeking it then we are those who love him if you don't love the word if you don't seek the word if you don't, you're not focused on the word 
it's doubtful if you really love him and you can't really grow to love God if you're not in the word because it's the word that manifests him to you the Bible says that the word is alive and active look quickly and how it explains it here in Hebrews 4 verse 12 Hebrews 4 verse 12 and I want you to listen to the re resemblance of Hebrews 4 verse 12 and 1 Corinthians 2 verse 15 where he talks about the spiritual man searches all things and so on so that's the spiritual man but listen to what he says about the word in Hebrews 4 verse 12 it says the same thing for the word that God speaks is alive and full of power making it active operative energizing and effective it is sharper than any two-edged sword penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life soul and the immortal spirit and of the joint and the marrow of the deepest parts of our nature exposing and sifting and analyzing judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart powerful and this is what the Bible says about the word and you can hear that the word and the spiritual man uh, it's as if they blend into one another and we know that the word became flesh and he dwelt amongst us John chapter 1 and 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 now the world uh, the word has entered us when we look at the scripture um, it entered us the Bible says in in in, in uh, John chapter 23 Judas, Judas asked him in verse 22, Judas not, not Iscariot said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So there's a separation to us and, and not to the world. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Here we see it again. He will keep my word and my father will love him and we he talks about we, he says, and we will come to him and make our home with him. This is powerful. This is powerful. So God says that him and the father will come to us and he will make our, his home within us. And so when we look at Hebrews chapter 4, and, uh, with chapter 4 verse 12, we see that the word of God speak, uh, uh, speak, uh, the word that God speaks is alive and full of power. You know, so um, when God comes and he and, and Jesus, they make their home with us. It is so powerful because then that word becomes alive. So when you start reading the word, the word is alive and it's active, says the Bible. It's alive. It will come alive in your spirit. When you start reaching, reading the word with, uh, with a spiritual mind and and uh, seeking out the word and keeping the word you see it's about doing the word it's not about just hearing the word the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word and a lot of pe preachers preach on that a lot of people say that we mention that scripture a lot you see but hearing the word only it brings faith faith comes by hearing and hearing the word so the faith comes by the hearing but you see but when you start doing the word then that word is established in you then it becomes real to you you see if you start doing things that the word tells you to do lay your hands on the sick preach the word um, you know and all these kinds of things build that character in your life then uh, when God manifests his word he does his word he is he, watchful over his word to perform it says the Bible when he starts performing his word by you doing his word then suddenly that thing becomes a revelation to you uh, the word becomes alive to you because you see it working and that establishes it in your heart you know and for so long in the church we've always been taught to hear the word faith comes by hearing but when we do the word it establishes the word it brings testimonies it brings um, uh, you know stuff that you can relate to where you've seen God do it before and he can do it again so in other words your faith is built it becomes stronger eventually you're in a place where you don't you're not afraid you don't care what people think you're not afraid what's going on because you have a total trust in God because he could do it before he can do it again let's just look in in um, Luke chapter uh, 6 and it says in verse 46 why do you call me Lord Lord and do not do what I say so a lot of people call him Lord Lord 
but we do not do what he say, says. So here we see that Jesus is, is actually bringing the church, he's bringing his disciples, he says to them, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So God wants us to keep his word. He wants us to do his word. He wants us to fulfill what he says, his commandments, we must do it. Must do it. I will show you, verse 47, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. So you mustn't just hear the word, you must put them into practice. And yet Jesus says, I will show you who is the man who does this, who hears my words and put them into practice. You know, in the church, we need to practice the word. We need to start doing the word. He says, he is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation. You see, when you start doing the word, word you hold the word, you, you love the word, you study the word, and you start doing the word, then it's like you're laying the foundation deep. You know, uh, they say practice makes perfect. When you start doing something, you get better at it. And for me, being a, a, a guy that can work with my hands, um, you know, when I do things, I get better at it the more I do it. And it's the same with the Word. The more you do it, the more you are digging down deep. You are establishing that thing in your heart. And the Bible says he is like the man who laid the foundation on the rock. You see, when you do the Word, then you lay the foundation on the rock. And Jesus said to me, to Peter, you are Simon, but you will be called Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And he talks about the word. Upon the word, I will build my church. And we know that the word became flesh and the word is Jesus. And Jesus and the Father is living in us. And because they are in us, we do the word as he gives it to us. We are in that same unity, in that same spirit. And we do the word and then it becomes established. It becomes a foundation. It, it's built on the rock by doing it. And I think that's where many of us um, uh, miss it with God. We don't do the word that often. For me as a pastor, I've been preaching for years. And, and, and every time I start talking to people about uh, going out and evangelism, uh, I even saw with my YouTube videos where I put it on where we're doing evangelism in the streets and stuff like that, then people, they don't really look at that. They're not really interested in that. You know, uh, people aren't interested in going and doing the work. You know, we are taught and everyone is just interested in, we want to be blessed, we want to uh, uh, have money, we want to prosper. Um, you know, and, 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 and that is the famous, that is the, 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 the uh, a lot, that is the road that, has many, that many has walked. But the road that the, 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 the road that no one walks, you see, that's the beaten path. But there's a road that a few people walk. And, and, and that is the road where we do the word, where we put it into practice, where we start doing it. You know, and, and we build our faith so much on, on uh, and I don't want to uh, eat that, but, uh, you know, uh, the, on prosperity and so on. So we have so much faith in prosperity and blessing. But what about our faith in healing? What about our faith in preaching the word? What about our faith in, in seeing God manifesting himself in a powerful way? And um, so it's important that we do the work. He says, when a flood came, the, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it. It could not shake it. So many people are shaken in this time where we have this coronavirus and uh, you know, all these things that's happening in our world. A lot of people are shaken by this. The storm has come and a lot of people are shaken by it. But you see, when you're in faith and you've done the word and you know that God will come through for you and that he will keep you safe, then um, you, you, you won't be that afraid. The Bible actually says in um, uh, John chapter 14 verse 27, uh, uh, just on a sideline, it says, Peace I leave with you. My own peace I now give and beget, beget, that is like an inheritance to you, that I leave with you like an inheritance. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. So the world can give us some peace and they try and give us peace of mind. When we look at the news and we listen to all these things and on Facebook and YouTube and you hear all these different opinions and these different things. I'm telling you church, 
we need to get to God. We need to tap into this oneness that we have with God, into this unity that we have with God the Father and the Son. And we need to start um, asking Him for direction because we are not getting the right direction from the news and the TV and all. These things will put fear in you. These things will make you worried. These things, is, there's so many lies you don't know what to believe. As believers, we need to tap into the Spirit and start listening. What is the Spirit saying? What is God saying? What is God instructing us to do? Because this is what is going to keep the church going and not to listen to man and man's ideas. He says, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Neither let you let them be afraid. So do not let the Bible says, do not let your heart be troubled. I don't know what people in the world do in the world do in times like these. But for us as believers, we do not allow our hearts to be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Do not let your heart be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. <laughs> Stop allowing yourself. I mean, and, and this morning, you know, there are so many people that are falling into depression in this time, in this time of lockdown, and we hear it everywhere. It's going on, and, and there are so many uh, violence in families and stuff that's going on in this time, you know, because people are caged into this thing. The Bible says, do not allow yourself to, to, be, to be agitated and dis, uh, disturbed. You know, we are allowing these things to disturb us. We are allowing these things to agitate us. But the Bible says, do not allow yourself. Stop allowing yourself to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves. You know, so many people are in depression. And this is what the Bible says. It says, do not permit yourself to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. And that is the characteristics of depression. You know, and the Bible says we must not permit ourselves. You see, depression, you deal with depression by deciding. I am not going to allow fear in my life. I'm not going to allow um, uh, intimidation in my life. Many people feel guilty. They feel cowardly, it says. It's a fear of the world, a fear of what can happen. It's a fear that comes into them. It makes them cowardly. And that's why so many people, they take their own lives because they feel like they can't face life anymore. But the Bible says, do not permit yourself. So you have the ability. You have the, the, the anointing of God. You have the power of God inside of you. The Word of God alive and active inside of you where you have the power not to permit yourself to be intimidated, be cowardly, be unsettled, be fearful. All right. So it's powerful to look at this and see this. And, 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 and it's, uh, so the Bible says in John, uh, John chapter 6, it says it's like a man who builds on the rock and, uh, uh, and, and, and who puts his word into practice. But he says the man who does not put them into practice is like a man who builds his house on the ground without a foundation so when you are not putting the you you see you can hear the word he says like the man who hears the word but does not put it into practice so you can hear the word it will bring faith into your life but if you do not put it into practice it will never be settled it will never be established and this is what the Bible says. He who does not put them into practice is like a man who builds his house on the ground. So you can hear the word. You can go to church every Sunday and hear the word. But if you don't put it into practice, then you are like a man who builds his house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, uh, the, uh, that house, it collapsed and his destruction was complete. That's why so many people are destroyed in this time. Um, because they, are not, they have not been building and putting the word into practice. They have not arm, armored themselves against the attack of the enemy. And that's why the enemy is coming in and is destroying people. So you need to arm yourself through the word. 
but when you start reading the word and doing the word then it becomes alive and active I just want to read it again Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 for the word that God speaks is alive and full of power when you start reading the word studying the word doing the word then it becomes full of power there's an anointing that comes over you that's why I always say we must preach the word you know uh, you must preach the word when you start preaching the word you know it's good to listen to the word but as believers we need to go out and preach the word when you're with your family when you're with people you tell them about the word you speak the word it's when you start speaking the word then only because it becomes powerful it becomes effective then only the word starts acting it starts doing when you speak to people suddenly it's like the anointing comes over you and you remember scriptures and you remember things and you start telling them and it's like eventually they just sit there and listen to you wow wow and it's so amazing and you so excited about this word because it just becomes alive in you so he says for the word that God speaks is alive and full of power making it active it starts acting it starts doing things making it active when you start uh, 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 seeking the word and speaking the word uh, uh, then it becomes activate it's activated you see and, and when we talk about activating a church we need to activate the church to start doing the word start doing what the Bible says and then um, uh, they will grow and they will increase and the word will become active active it says operative it starts operating it says energizing it's operating and it's energizing I am so full of energy after I've preached because of the anointing that was on me it takes me a while to quiet down and a lot of pastors you will hear when they say it takes them a while to quiet down especially if there was anointing when when I preach and there's no anointing and I, I struggle with my message then I feel so tired afterwards I just want to go and sleep it's like I feel bad because I had to push this thing in my own strength and try and get this word across and I feel that in the church uh, sometimes you know but but when the word is alive and it becomes active and it energizes you it you become so excited about the word and you can hear my voice it's excitement it says and effective then the word becomes effective it, the, the word that God speaks is alive it becomes effective when the word comes alive in you then it becomes effective it touches the hearts of people it's like your spirit is speaking to their spirit it's deep calling unto deep it is like your spirit is touching their spirit when I preached in the streets I usually when I preached, it was sometimes I felt the presence of God come over me and the hunger and the, the for God to touch his people and the word becomes like a cry like John the Baptist cry in the wilderness and I started feeling that crying of my voice it's like a cry going out to those people and then it's like the people's spirits it's like their spirit starts drawing from that spirit that is released by me speaking it and when they start drawing and when they start doing the Bible says Jesus couldn't do any miracles because they didn't have belief in him you know uh, but when people start drawing and when you start speaking the word it becomes alive it becomes active um, it becomes effective and then people start drawing that word and their spirit cries out for it it's like they don't understand why it's like people uh, that don't go to church and then you you force them and you ask them and you bring them to church one day and eventually when they there and and the pastor preaches and there's an anointing and I've seen it so many times suddenly those people they start crying and 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 it's like they filled with all these emotions you know the Bible says it's penetrating uh, 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 the Bible says the word is sharper than any two-edged sword penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life that is between the soul and the spirit it penetrates like a two-edged sword to into the divining line between the soul and the spirit it touches the deepest part of a man's heart it says and the uh, and the immortal spirit and of joint and marrow the word goes into the bones into the joints of the deepest parts of our nature the words go into the deepest part of your nature it's deep calling unto deep as a believer as a child of God as a person in the world your spirit is searching for God that's why you never settled you never resting 
You, you always feel that you have to go to this jaw or that place because your spirit is searching for something and it is searching for, for God. You see, and that's why when they hear the word in the church, suddenly they start crying. It's like all these emotions just comes out of, out of them. It's like they don't know why, uh, because it's the spirit of God that is effective. It's energizing. It's active. Uh, you know, and, and it's so powerful. And then it starts speaking to their spirit. The Bible says exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. <laughs> so the word is so powerful. And when you're a spiritual man and you speak to people, then your word and when you speak to them, you, you start analyzing, you start seeing. God shows you what is going on in that person's heart. And when you speak, it's like you get revelation as you speak. And the more you speak, the more you see their face change. The more you see them experiencing this word, taking this word. Uh, uh, you know, it's so powerful. It's a powerful thing to experience. But it's when we do the word. You know, I think so many times as as believers um, we are spiritual beings you know and so many times as pastors we we come and we try to appeal to the intellect of people our messages are designed with points and facts and all kinds of things and we try and reach the uh, the intellect of people oh we want to bedazzle them with the beautiful word we have and the nice revelation we've got we want to bedazzle them and just make them feel good and wow this is so powerful you know but why aren't we focusing on the spirit of the man the heart of a man we must speak to his heart i wrote a side note here as a spiritual man why do we sometimes appeal only to the intellect of a man or the soul. So many times we focused on the soul. The soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. We want to touch the emotions, um, and the, that is what we must do. We must. Uh, it, the Bible says that it cuts to the dividing line of the soul and the spirit. So when we speak, we must speak to his mind. We must speak to his spirit. We must speak to his emotions. We must speak to his will. He will want to act. You know, and therefore I believe that as as people of God. Uh, you know, we mustn't focus on the flesh. So many times our preaching is focused on the flesh. You just want people to feel good. You just want them to uh, um, uh, act in their flesh. You know, so many times people act fleshly. And um, yeah, I don't want to go into that. But we must focus on their hearts. And this is what the Bible says the Word does. It cuts to the dividing line of the soul and spirit. Join a marrow. It searches out the deepest parts of their hearts. You know, and, and I believe that when we speak the word as, as pastors, as mm -hmm. believers, you must rather touch the heart of a person. You know, when I, uh, my wife and I, when we speak to our children and we discipline our children uh, or guide them, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. Uh, we many times take our children and we, we uh, when I speak to them, I will wait for the right opportunity. Sometimes when I go and drop them off at school, I'll see something that they do or something that they do that's not right or the way that they act with a friend or say something about someone. And then I'll always come and I'll tell them, you know, I'll first of all, sometimes I find out, but why is this child like that treating them the way that they are? We put them in a normal school for them to experience normal people, to go through the, the criticism and, and the teasing and all these kinds of things so they can become strong. But as parents, we must train them and we must help them to take their stand against these things that the other children and people say about them. But eventually it makes them emotionally strong. So many um, pastors, uh, you know, or so many kids are uh, at home. They never experience other kids. They never experience the teasing. And when they ever they step into real life, it's so difficult for them because now um, suddenly they have to face all these things and then they try and pull away and they'll rather go and lock themselves in their house and in their home and then depression comes and all these kinds of things and they feel that they're not good enough and all these things but our children we send them to a normal school so that they can experience people they learn to deal with criticism and then we are there as parents you know and so many times and what I'm saying is that when they come and I see something then I'll go to them 
and I'll tell them a story or I'll tell them, you know, that child, maybe they're going through that. Or they'll tell me and say, no, but this child, no, this, he doesn't have a mom or she doesn't have a father or, or whatever it might be. And then I understand the child and then I tell them uh, to bring them to a place where they will understand that child. And suddenly, like my youngest girl is always, and then, oh no, I didn't know. And she'll just start crying because she didn't understand. You know, and so many times with our children, we must tell them something. You know, uh, to bring the heart across of the thing. You know, not just the intellect. You don't tell you, no, point number one you must do. Point number two, you know, you tell them. I tell them a story or I'll take something that happened in my life or someone one that I know that something happened to and I speak to them about the story. Then they remember the story and the story touches their hearts and it's like it cuts into their hearts. And even I use scripture. I say the Bible says this and the Bible says that. And then, wow, wow. And my youngest girl will always just go, Oh, thanks, Dad. Yes, I will remember. And then she goes off and she carries on. But my eldest daughter, she will sit there and her eyes will grow big. And she will look at me and get a little frown on her face. And then say, but Daddy, what about this? And then she asks into the story and she wants all the detail. And then I use that to give her the detail. Then the younger one will come back and listen to the detail. You know, and then I tell her everything. And then it's like she takes it in. You can see how she, uh, she drinks it in. And when I'm finished... She will walk away and she will go and do it and she, she, she will just execute what I was saying, you know. And then they'll come back the evening. My youngest girl, I thought she didn't even really listen. She'll come back, Daddy, I remember what you told. And I told them the story and I told them about this person. And, and, and suddenly she and the person becomes friends and, and everything just works out. And it's not always like that. Sometimes they come back and they're broken. But, but then we lift them up again and we encourage them and we send them back into that field to go and, and handle that thing, handle that teaching. You know, and so many times as parents, we, 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 we cover our children so much. You know, we, uh, in Afrikaans we say, Ons people are up. You know, we, 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 we protect them so much that they don't uh, get, build up a defense against the things of the world. It's important that as believers as well, and I want to bring that into a believer, but knowing the heart and, uh, and God living inside of you, God wants to us to mature. You know, the disciple, uh, uh, Jesus spent three years with his disciples, bringing them into a place of maturity. He, he, his whole purpose and his whole thing with them was to bring them to maturity. He wanted to show by example. He was, he was the, uh, really discipling them. He, they stayed with him. They walked with him. They did everything with him. They ate with him. And, and, and he really discipled them. Uh, uh, in three years, he established them in the Word. In three years, he showed them the Word. In three years, he got them to a place where they will be able to do it because he had one purpose in mind, and that was that they must fill the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he succeeded in that because when he died and he went to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit, they went and they started preaching the gospel. And that gospel that they preached is still going on today. Because he didn't just teach them the word, tell them the word. He took them and they practiced the word. They did the word. That's why I take my church on an open air service to experience it, to pray for people. I tell them, go speak to your family, speak to friends, whatever. And I preach the word to them. They hear the word and it becomes alive and active. And I want to activate them to do it. Because when they do it, they come back with a testimony. They come back with something. You know, and, and even in the church, as pastors, sometimes we, 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 protecting our church so much, and especially as a pastor, you know, a apostle is one, the Bible says he's a sent one. And when he is sent, he wants to send everyone. You know, because he knows that he was sent and to go into the world, no matter where, no matter what place. Apostle is usually one that doesn't care about how he gets, you can leave him anywhere and he will build a church, plant a church. Um, uh, you know, that's an apostle. He doesn't lay the foundation again on someone else. So many churches are planted from another church, uh, taken from another church. You know, um, and, 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 and so many times Paul says, I do not lay the foundation. I do not labor in another man's field. Uh, an apostle is someone that will establish a work for God uh, 
a new work for God and then build from there on. You know, but the pastor is a shepherd. He takes care of the sheep and he wants the sheep and, and he will gather the sheep. And that's his anointing. That's his calling to gather. But that's why I believe sometimes that the fivefold ministry must work through a church. Sometimes as a pastor, you must invite an apostle, invite an evangelist. Because evangelist will come and he will teach them to win souls. That is his function. The fivefold ministry is there. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, he says the fivefold ministry is there to, or is it six? He's there to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You know, and we must equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Um, that is our task. Evangelist equips the saints to do evangelism. The pastor equips the saints to shepherd. The teacher equips the saints to teach. And the apostle equips the saints to go out and to, to, to preach and establish new works for God. Establish a home cell. Maybe plant a church at another place. You know, and as an apostle, you will have this heart. From an apostle, churches will spring up. You will plant churches and not laboring another man's vineyard, taking other churches. Uh, uh, yes, you adopt churches, you adopt these things, but it's really going there and planting and establishing. It's a powerful anointing and thing. You know, and, and I just want to end with this. Uh, I have a few minutes left, and I want to end with this this morning. You know, uh, it's time that the church matures. I know uh, it sounds bad when I say this, and I don't say this in arrogance. I say this in humbleness. You know, when I was a boy, my dad always said, you need to grow up. Uh, he always said to me, you must learn to think for yourself. And many times I would say, but think for myself. What does he mean? What does he mean by thinking for myself? Uh, I am thinking. Uh, um, and, and, and what he was saying, I later on discovered, what he was saying is, Trevor, get to understand what I'm teaching you. We will work on a truck and he will say, take this pipe and pull this thing and do that and pull it or whatever. And I won't have understanding of what he's saying, so I don't know what to do. And then he will grab the thing. Sometimes uh, he will be angry. Man, take this thing and do this. You put it down. No, no, no. And, and he's agitated. And then I grab it and I do it. And, and then I'm so worried about I'm do if I'm doing it right, I'm not really taking in what he's showing me. And at other times he will show me, and but I learned quickly, and I saw, okay, I must do it this way. Okay, I understand, and I catch on quickly, and this uh, where this clutch must go, and how the flywheel goes uh, under it, and how the pressure plate goes on, and the pilot shaft must push through that, you know, putting in a gearbox or whatever, and then I understand it, and later on when I understood it, I got to places where he said to me, no, we must do this and that, and I said, Dad, it doesn't work that way. You must do it this way. No, nah, man, you want to tell me? And then eventually he tries it and doesn't work. And I say, no, it works this way because he always left me to put in the gearbox. He always left me to do this, to do that. So I got good at it, and he was good at it. But later on, um, I started telling him how to do it, and then he, that is where he uh, was succeeded in what he wanted to teach me and and later on I had trucks I could fix my own trucks I drove my own trucks uh, I could do anything build the engine rebuild I learned to spray I can do all these kinds of things because of my dad teaching me and training me and allowing me to do it you know and and that is what we must do as ministers we must teach our people train them get them to go out activate them you know, I was speaking about that uh, last uh, in one of my previous videos as well, and we will come to that, where you lay hands on them and you anoint them to go out and do the work. Sometimes you, we must send our people. Don't just be a pastor to gather. You know, you can see a pastor, he just wants to gather, gather, gather. He, the more people he can get, the more uh, uh, successful he feels, and the more people he has around him, and many times it's uh, for financial gain as well. You know, but the more people he gathers, but that is the heart of a pastor, he just gathers. But when you're an apostle, you just want to send. You want to get people out there. You want to get them to go and, and, and preach the gospel. You want to get them to go and win souls. You want to get them to, to, to plant churches, to, to establish new works for the Lord. Go to the end of, ends of the earth. It's such a powerful anointing uh, being an apostle. You know, and uh, as a teacher, you just want to teach them. You just want to equip them in a word. But this morning, I want to pray for you, and I'm ending with this. Um, you know, we need to mature the church. Get them to the place where they think for themselves. And this is what the Word says here. That's why Jesus said uh, that I, He who loves me, who does my word, who keeps my word, we will come to Him and make our home with Him. So the criteria for God to make His home with you is for you to love Him, to keep His word, 
seek his word and do his word then God sees that you are willing to do it you know he, he sees that you want to do it and then he will come and he will make his home with you the Bible says and God will live in you God wants to be in you as a pastor, as a pastor as a teacher we must bring God into the hearts of people we must teach them God teach them Jesus you know not our own ideas teach them Jesus and then they must take that and start duplicating and doing what you have been teaching them so this morning maybe you are sitting here and and you saying Lord eternal pray for me I need to get to a better place I want to mature in God uh, I'm afraid to start doing the will of God and and in this series following I'm gonna do the gifts of the Spirit and I'm gonna do how they work and how they function to activate the church for us to be able to go out there and do the work of the ministry and if you are saying Trevor I want to do that I want to go and, and preach the gospel I want to I want to be a minister of God I've been in the church maybe for so long and I never get released or I never get going um, you know I want to pray for you uh, so let's just pray father right now I pray for every person that's listening to this message father this morning is about uh, God and this Jesus living in us father God that we are in that unity with him father and I pray this morning that we will catch the heart of God that your word will become alive and active operative in us father that we will start doing your word and that we will touch and change lives around us father help us to respond to the calling help us to respond to this calling especially in this time father where there are so many people turning to you so many people going through distress help us to respond to that calling and to start doing your word and growing uh, and maturing in Jesus name amen God bless you we love you enjoy your day and um, I hope to see you tomorrow again uh, listening to the next part of this series we love you God bless bye